Welcome to Discovering the Law. My name is Lucy Rivera and I am the host of this program. This episode can be viewed at www.discoveringthelaw.com. Today we have one of the veterans from the Superior Court of Massachusetts, Judge Paul Chernoff, and he is here today to talk to us about his book. Welcome, Judge Chernoff. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming to our program today. Why did you write your second book? Well, you recall in the first book, yes. I tried to talk about things that I wish my grandparents had talked to me about. Mm -hmm. I knew them as next door neighbors and they were wonderful people, but after they passed, I realized I didn't know much about their lives and uh, what really mattered to them. So in the first book, I captured 110 vignettes from my experience and mainly my experience as a district court judge and a superior court judge, and I just told those experiences uh, to my grandchildren, and with no moral to any of these stories, they would have to figure it out for themselves. But for this second book, uh, first of all, I knew that I, I had only scratched the surface, uh, yeah. because if you're a judge for 35 years, you have far more than 110 stories to tell. You may have a 1,000 stories. So I took another 100 stories, and I set them out in a way that was a little different, so they had a moral to these stories, so that the grandchildren would understand what I wanted them to get out of the stories. And I'm sure that there might be another book someplace, but I'm not so sure. I have a dentist friend, and he asked me, after I gave him the, the second book, if I was going to write another. So I took the book back from him, and I wrote on it, um, the first book was like brushing, <laughs> the second book was like flossing, oh. and the third book would be like pulling teeth. So I don't think I'm going to do it. How about rinsing? That's yeah. the... And in the second book, Your Honor, you write a lot of poetry from Robert Frost. Why? Okay. First of all, my grandfather had me learning Robert Frost from age five, mm -hmm. and I've learned many, many Robert Frost poems, probably 12 or 15 of them, and I've kept those in memory along with other poems, and I'm teaching them to my grandchildren. Robert Frost was a New England uh, uh, poet, a wonderful poet who taught people things that would last a lifetime, <clears throat> things that would be relevant to 50 years ago, to today, and 50 years from today. And he did it by very simple uh, views, views of nature, um, uh, storms at sea, snowstorms, mm -hmm. uh, the month of November and October, how that's reflected in nature, about animals. Uh, his, one of his most beautiful poems is The Oven Bird. So he looks at these individual things in nature and then tells us a lot of things about a lot. Uh, he talks about uh, uh, paths in a wood that, uh, that diverge. And you remember one of the poems was, uh, 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 Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and it has made all the difference. So you see, there's a certain rhythm to his poetry also. It is beautiful. Please recite to us one of his poems. Can you do that? I, I'll try. Okay. Um, it's called uh, Once Over the Pacific. The shattered water makes a misty din. Great waves looked over others coming in and thought of doing something to the shore that water never did to land before. The sky was uh, the, the sky was uh, the clouds were low and hairy in the sky, like locks blown against the glint of eye. You couldn't tell, although it looked as if the land was lucky in being backed by cliff and the cliff in being backed by continent. It looked as though a night of dark intent was coming, and not only a night and age. Someone had better be prepared for rage. There would be more than ocean water broken before God's last put out the light was spoken. Now, this is obviously about a horrendous happening in the Pacific Ocean. And the question is, what was it? He tells us in the poem, uh, God's last put out the light. And Frost quotes Shakespeare a lot. And put out the light is the end of Othello when the king puts out the light of the queen by murdering her. And so it really means a human being taking the life of another. So when I learned that poem, uh, and my wife and I were discussing it, it was in 2001 in the fall. And we concluded that he was talking about Pearl Harbor that it was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and this was this horrible storm on the Pacific that took a lot of human life and destroyed our naval facility out there. And uh, we were absolutely convinced. And then 9-11 happened, 
and I was in Lowell sitting on the bench uh, in the Lowell Superior Court, and I saw in the newspaper earlier that morning that uh, Robert Pinsky, our poet laureate, was speaking at Middlesex Community College about 9-11. Mm -hmm. So at lunch hour, I went over and I sat in the back of the auditorium. And a young woman raised her hand and she said, Dr. Pinsky, how long will it take after 9-11 now before there's really quality writing? We're too traumatized right now before there's wonderful poetry, wonderful prose about 9-11. And Dr. Pinsky thought for a moment and he said, sometimes the, the most significant writing about an event occurred 15 years before the event, or 20 years, or sometimes even much more than that. So we just thought he was being sort of glib, and, uh, and I sort of passed it off a little bit. And when I got home, I mentioned it to my wife, and then we said, well, what about uh, Robert Frost's poem about the Pacific, and that we thought he wrote because of Pearl Harbor? Well, we got it out, and we looked, and we saw, sure enough, he wrote it 15 years before Pearl Harbor. And so there's a real message to that, and that, to my grandchildren, and that is when you're trying to analyze today's events, you can really look backwards to some of the great writers because they write about human nature, and human nature doesn't change. So you can go back to Frost 75 years ago, or you can go to Shakespeare 500 years ago. And that's why I think that poem is so important to, to, to me and to this book. Uh, Your Honor, um I want to ask you um, not only the philosophy about and the beauty that you have just made an analogy of, but why um, do you think there are problems in patents, um, in copyrights, uh, mm. because you are quoting Robert Frost in your book? Yeah. That's, uh, that is an issue. It wasn't an issue when I wrote the book because I thought Robert Frost wrote so long ago that the copyright has to be uh, passed by this time and that uh, I would be safe. But the individual mm -hmm. who helps me with the cover of the book mm -hmm. said to me, you better check on whether or not Robert Frost's uh, copyrights have expired. So I oh. checked. I went to the Amherst Library where his works are and they uh, couldn't help me, but they put me in touch with the trustee of the Robert Frost estate. I went up to Montpelier, Vermont, and I talked mm. to the trustee, and he said, sure enough, the patent, the uh, copyright is alive, and uh, it's not going to expire for a while. But he couldn't give me permission, but he put me in touch with the publishing company that owns Robert Frost's works. And it, it turns out that these... Uh, that they're covered by copyright protection until the year 2030. So I eventually, I eventually uh, talked with the Henry Holt Publishing Company, and they were very courteous and very nice to me. And they, for a very small sum of money, I, I purchased the right to reprint Robert Frost's poetry in this book. Why is there a, a problem that you do that, that you copyright somebody's work uh, with a, and how long does a, mm -hmm. does a copyright last? Well, it's usually 75 years after the passing of the writer uh, or the publication. But um, I guess the reason it's important is if that somebody uh, uses their creative genius to write something, uh, whether, it's, uh, a, whether it's poetry, prose, or whether uh, uh, they take wonderful photographs or they compose art things, uh, they have an ownership interest in it. And if anybody wants to use it to make money, uh, they ought to pay for it. That's the theory behind it. The problem is whether or not that has a chilling effect on people who want to <coughs> use the works for teaching other people. I want to use this work to, to uh, help my grandchildren and to help other people who might learn a little bit from it and not certainly to make a lot of money on this. Um, and um, how are you teaching your children, your grandchildren in this book? Are there any humorous stories that you want to share with us? Well, I could. Okay. Um, I take... I try to take true-to-life stories from the court. Mm -hmm. And sometimes something that's humorous to me doesn't turn out to be humorous to everybody. <laughs> but one story from this year, just very recently, a lawyer was representing a person who was charged with a drug crime. And the lawyer stands up before me and he says, Judge, I want you to know that uh, I have to make a disclosure for the record. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, my client got arrested for breaking and entering two weeks ago. So I said, okay, thank you very much, because, you know, people get into trouble. And uh, I said, thank you. And he said, no, Judge, you don't understand. He broke into my house, and he took <laughs> my property. And so, you know, you couldn't make up a story like that. And so, you know, everybody was really kind of charmed by that story, but it wasn't very funny to him. 
uh, will now tell us about a story that uh, gives a message to your grandchildren, as you wanted to point it out. Okay. I mean, it's like, uh, almost every story that I write gives a message to the grandchildren, okay. but some are more important messages than, uh, than others. Um, uh, one story is um, when uh, one time my, uh, uh, my father-in-law, who is 90 years old, uh, oh. 92 years old, in fact, and my son, who was 40 years old at the time, and me, I was in my 60s at the time. We were in Vermont at the farmhouse, which is my wife's family, and uh, we were cutting wood and splitting the wood so we could burn it in the stove. And so my father-in-law, who was... Uh, 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 in the military for his whole lifetime, but uh, he grew up on the farm, he could take a big piece of wood and he could take the ax and he could read wood and he would hit the uh, big log once and it would split uh, because he just could read wood. And my son um, was very strong because after my father-in-law split his piece of wood, he handed the ax to my son and my son goes like this and he's very strong <laughs> and he splits the wood and then they <coughs> hand the, the ax to me. I'm not as strong as my son and I certainly don't have the talent that my father-in-law have and I start hitting the wood and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and finally it's split. And so what I tell that story to the grandchildren, I tell them that sometimes to succeed in this world, you need a combination of skill, which yeah. is what my father-in-law showed. Even at 90 years old, he could split the wood. Um, and uh, strength, which is what my son, who is very strong, was able to do it simply through brute force. And then me, through perseverance of just doing it over and over and over again. I think that's a good lesson to a, to a youngster, is that you have to really think in terms of all three things in order to succeed. Yes, I agree. Good lesson. This is a, everybody should read this book. <laughs> well, thank you. Your Honor, um, you also talk about embarrassing stories about yourself. I do. And why do you do that? And uh, do you want to share some of them? Oh, with sure. You? <laughs> well, why I do it, I think, is very important. I want the grandchildren to look upon me not as some judge who's up in the stratosphere. I want them to look at me as a human being who's just as vulnerable, makes mistakes just like everyone else, and that I'm a real human being. And that's important because they know me better as a person, and they won't look to people like judges and think that they are uh, gods because we're not. We're just regular people who do a lot of dumb things uh, at all at stages of their lives. So if I look back in my life at the kind of uh, dumb things that I have done, I remembered when I applied to college, uh, three of the colleges I applied to were in this area, one to Tufts, one to Worcester Polytech, mm -hmm. and one to Rensselaer in New York. And I remember that those colleges, as colleges do today, require that you write essays as to why you want to go to the college, that particular college. I mixed up the essays, and I sent one college a letter that said why I wanted to go to the other college, and then I sent the other college a letter as to why I wanted to go to the first college, and, uh, and, and then I found out, you know, I knew quickly that I had made the mistake, and I sent them letters and sent, and sent the appropriate letters uh, to them. And the interesting thing is, is that I got into all three colleges, and uh, I think either they don't read the essays or they had a very good sense of humor. But that's, that's a story in myself. The other story that I, that I tell them is about how I missed a meeting with the President of the United States. Oh. My wife's father mm -hmm. was the captain of a brand new oceanographic ship that was going to go around the world. It was, and the ship was brought to Washington, D.C. I was going to law school. I was married, and uh, so President Lyndon Johnson came to the ship to christen the ship. And I was there with my wife and my mother-in-law, and we were going on the ship to meet President Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson. So my mother-in-law goes on the ship, my wife goes on the ship, they're going up the gangplank, and I said, just wait one minute, I'm gonna step back here and I'm gonna take a photograph of you going up the gangplank. So I stepped back, I took the photograph, and then I walked up to the gangplank, and the uh, security people were there, and they said, sorry, no more people are being let on the ship. And so they stopped me and they stopped some of President Johnson's aides from going on the ship. <laughs> so my wife and mother-in-law went on the ship and they had a nice chat with the President of the United <laughs> States. And here I was at the bottom of the gangplank having an uh, egg on my face. That's so, a great story. <laughs> that's a, it's a very good story, but it's a very human story as to uh, uh, these kinds of things happen. It should, it should, it, it, when these things happen, you shouldn't hide them. You should just show that you're, you're mm. human.
Um, I, there is a story in your book about the cat's meow. Do you want to share that story? Sure. That, that's, that's really consistent with what we're talking about. When you're a judge, in a way, it's very isolating. On the other hand, you are placed in a position where society puts you really in the limelight. And the question is, how do you deal with that? And I can remember, this was fairly recently, I was going into a session that I was presiding over uh, in the Middlesex Superior Court, and I was in my uh, chambers, which we call a judge's lobby. I was in the judge's lobby, and I went into the uh, bathroom there to comb my hair, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had my robe on, and I looked in the mirror, and I looked at myself, and I said, you know, you're gonna go in that courtroom in just a couple of minutes, and here you are, black robe on, your hair's combed, you're gonna walk into the room and everybody's gonna stand up because the court officer's gonna say, all rise, and then I'm gonna sit down and everyone else will sit down, and for the next two hours, people will be calling me your honor and, and uh, uh, judge, and they'll say thank you, whether they wanna thank you or not, they always say, uh, say thank you, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and your honor is an elevating thing. I'm glad I'm not in, in England, they call the judges your worship <laughs> and in France they call the judges mon maître oh. meaning my master so mm, uh, maître, maître. so but but <laughs> any, nevertheless they, they call you your honor here and then when we're through with the session uh, I'll stand up and everybody else will stand up until I leave the courtroom well you know that that's pretty intoxicating to think about that and uh, so I thought about that for just a moment and then I thought about Robert Frost and what Robert Frost would say to judges. And he had two poems in particular that I think he almost wrote for judges. And uh, one is a poem that's called For Once Then uh, Something. And it's the story of a man who looks into a well cap, in other words, looks into a well. Mm -hmm. And he looks down at the water and he sees a mirror image of himself. And he sees, he's, he's got ferns around him, he's got green around him. He sees the sky behind him, which is blue and there's cloud puffs. He looks almost like an angel. Mm -hmm. He's really the cat's meow <laughs> until a pebble falls into the water and it's all for naught. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's gone, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then then so that's one story. In other words, you're it, it's very it doesn't last very long. And then the other thing is it's. Uh, um, it, it, so much of it is luck, and there's not so much talent or anything else. Uh, Frost wrote another poem, If you should rise from nowhere up to somewhere, from being no one up to being someone, be sure to keep repeating to yourself that you owe it to an arbitrary God whose mercy on you rather than to, to others won't bear too close examination. And so it really just means I'm just like everybody else, and I just happen to be in a particular situation at a particular time. So I think that's a very good uh, lesson for the grandchildren. That is a really important lesson. Thank you. Um, now, you, in your book, you talk about the importance of connecting with people. And tell us about that. Sure. I think it's very important in this world to connect with people. Uh, first of all, that you should do something so that other people will remember you, okay. but that you should also relate to people in a way that they will respect you. And I remember when I was in the service, uh, I was on a ship with a number of other junior officers, and when they had time off, they would sit in the wardroom and they would play cards, or they would have political discussions. I never did that. I went out on the uh, back deck of the ship, which is where the, uh, the sailors go. Uh, people who, most of them didn't go to high school, and they're just, uh, the, but there are people who had rich lives, and I would sit back there with them, and I, have the, I would have them teach me things. Mm -hmm. So here I was, a college graduate, a freshly minted lieutenant junior grade, well, before that I was an ensign, and they taught me knots. And they taught me, and to this day, I could tie a bowline, a, a, a navel knot with my eyes closed. They taught me many, many things. And the importance of that is, is that you can learn things from people that other people might think uh, uh, wouldn't be able to teach you anything. And when you do that, two things happen. Like, I learned all of these navel knots, but what was more important, those people learned, those sailors learned that I really cared and respected them and that they always treated me better than the other officers because they knew that I respected them. And I've tried to carry that through life. When I was chairman of the parole board, I would go out on the street with parole officers uh, to, so that they could teach me what they were doing. In the court system, I spend a lot of time with non-judges so that they can teach me what they do. And so I gain a lot, and then they uh, really give back to me because they know how much I respect them. So that's what I mean by connectivity.
And I think you do the excellent connectivity and anyone <laughs> <laughs> better than you, Judge Chernoff. Uh, our guest today is Honorable Judge Chernoff. He's a, one of the veterans of the Superior Court of Massachusetts. And uh, Judge Chernoff, um, I want us to please tell us um, another story about your book. Um, well, um, your experiences on the on the train. Uh, I'm not sure that you have them in your book, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you would like to talk about them. As sure. A when I uh, two years ago, I uh, went part time as a judge. I come back and sit as a magistrate two days per week. The third day, I uh, volunteer in. Uh, preside over mediations uh, in Woolben at the Middlesex Court. But on Thursday and Friday, I ride the T into Boston. Mm -hmm. And I uh, and I'm a veteran rider of the T. I don't miss a Thursday <laughs> or a Friday. And and it was a revelation to me how people treat people on the T, especially mm -hmm. if you're a senior citizen. When I come home, it's always rush hour and you can't get a seat on the T. And uh, so I stand and uh, I would say quite often somebody will offer me a seat. It's always a woman, never a man. You have all these young men on the tee and they're looking at their phones and uh, it's only a woman and it's usually a minority woman. It's a Hispanic woman, a, uh, an Asian woman, an African-American woman. It could be also a Caucasian woman, but it's <laughs> usually a woman. And that's such a revelation. Now, my wife tells me that I shouldn't think ill of these men who just <laughs> sit there. Um, uh, incidentally, when somebody offers me a seat, I don't take it anyways. Uh, and if a disabled person comes on, I will go over to a young man and I'll say, how about giving your seat? And they yes, do. They stand absolutely. up and they're fine. They do it. And what my wife says is that men are not multifaceted. They focus on their cell phones to listen to something or to read something, and they don't look around them, while women are used to multitasking. And so a woman may look at a cell phone or something, but she'll also be aware of her environment and that she'd be more likely to see somebody who's uh, a senior citizen and, and offer them a seat. Uh, so I think that's a, a kind of an, a, a very interesting observation. But, but really for minority people, and maybe it's that the minority people have had experiences in this world that they know what trouble is and they know what it might be for a hardship more than another person. But, but that was a real revelation, revelation on the T. Thank you, Judge Chernoff. Um, now tell us, um, we, we're almost running out of time, but mm -hmm. I wanted to, to you to share the story about the African boy that you oh, met at the T. Okay. <laughs> on the T, uh, a man gets on who's in his 20s, and he, was, he, he looked like he was foreign, uh, very dark skin from Africa, and he's with a little boy, and the little boy is burned from the top of his head down to here. And uh, it took a while to look at the boy uh, because he it, it was, it was very disfigured. Um, I gave up my seat to them so they could sit together, but then I found a seat nearby and I talked with them. And they're both from Burundi. The little boy was, uh, comes from the poorest part of the poorest nation. And uh, he, there was an accident in his little village and he, there's no water, there's no telephone, there's no electricity. He fell into a cooking fire and burned his face. And he went for two years with no treatment until a missionary came through. And then they made arrangements through a mission in uh, Idaho to bring the young boy to Boston for treatment at the Shriner Burn Center. And this man who was with the boy is just an angelic person. He's a priest from Burundi, from the other side of the nation. He graduated college. He couldn't get a job there, but he's taking six months off to be the caretaker for this boy and taking him for treatment at the, uh, at, at the hospital and uh, Mass Eye and Ear and, uh, oh. and the, and the uh, uh, burn center and the boys and he are staying with the family in Needham. So my wife and I have sort of almost adopted the little boy. He's so bright <laughs> and four months ago he didn't know a word of English. He only knew a tribal language from Burundi and today I speak to him as if he was one of my grandchildren because he's totally fluent in English. So that's a, so we've helped them but I've been helped more than he has. And that's another story for the grandchildren. Um, Judge Jarnoff, thank you for, for your warmth and thank you for uh, this insight. And uh, to our viewers, today we had Honorable Judge Jarnoff. He is a Superior Court Judge and um, this is Discovering the Law. If you want to see this episode again, you can watch it at www.discoveringthelaw.com. Thank you for watching us and my name is Lucy Rivera. <laughs>